My name is uh, Virginie Gilbert. I work at the Ministry of Foreign and European Affairs of Luxembourg. Um, I'm in charge there of uh, global education and environment and climate change. Um, I had the, uh, the great honor and pleasure to co-chair the, the drafting committee of this declaration this year, together with, with Fei Lim. Um, and I also represent Luxembourg um, at, the, um, in, at the Gene Roundtables. Um, before coffee this morning, we've had very warm welcomes from a host, co-hosts, and partners. We've been inspired by the, the keynote of Dr. Garnier. And we've heard in panel one some interesting views on the integration of global education into systems at all level. So now, just before lunch, we will look at, um, at the ways in which global education brings together different traditions, different terminologies, and also different stakeholders to develop a common vision. So it's my great pleasure now to introduce Ida McDonnell from the OECD. Um, Ida is the team leader for OECD Development Cooperation Report. She has previously been involved in the DAC peer review process and at the Development Center. Ida is committed to advance evidence-based policymaking as head of research and innovation for the OECD flagship Development Cooperation Report with impact on OECD priorities on poverty and inequalities, transparency and impact of foreign development assistance, and investing in digital transformation. Before she worked at the OECD, Ida worked in Ireland as a researcher in global education. She has been a long-standing friend of an, an, an advocate for global education and was one of the key figures in the original Maastricht Congress 20 years ago. So Ida, welcome home and welcome back. Thank you very much, Lydia. Well, th thank you very much. Uh, hello to you all. Uh, it's a great pleasure uh, to be here uh, at this Congress in my home country. Um, and many thanks to Jean, Ireland, Luxembourg, and, and everyone else involved in this event uh, for the invitation. So I was, as was just mentioned, I was really lucky enough, uh, I was a bit of a, a young one at the time, I guess, uh, to participate in the Maastricht Congress uh, 20 years ago. And that was a really a key milestone in the history of global education in Europe, uh, in my view. The Maastricht Congress and Declaration played a foundational role in developing a shared vision for global education, but it has guided policies and investments and learning in the right direction over the past 20 years. Let me just take a second to remember someone very special uh, who was involved in that process and declaration, because it was inspired by the vision and leadership of a friend, a mentor, and a believer in the power of global education for a more just one world. This person was Mr. Henny Helmick, who is the former executive director of the Dutch Foundation and NGO, NCDO. Sadly, Henny is no longer with us, but his legacy is here today, and he would be thrilled to feel the energy in this room <coughs> and would be so happy to be mixing and inspiring and convincing and negotiating with all of you to do better on global education. So, to Henny. So as we've, heard, as we've heard this morning, global education uh, brings together many different but really related concepts and traditions in education. This process around the declaration has involved a wide range of stakeholders. I've had the pleasure of also participating in those discussions to come up with a common vision that we can all work behind and work forward on. So this panel will explore the potential to join concepts, to align strategies, for global education in Europe and beyond. We have a superb lineup of speakers who represent education policy, local government, civic action, youth and development cooperation. You are experts in your field. You know each other's sectors a bit. Um, and you are really committed to placing global issues at the heart of learning in formal and non-formal uh, settings. So let me introduce them all because I think it's important to know where they come from and then we'll get the discussion going. We have Anja Fortuna, and you're Vice President of the European Youth Forum, former President of the National Youth Council of Slovenia, and a former board member of the Slovenian Rural Youth Association. Um, you're also a trainer uh, with Rural Youth uh, Europe. Welcome. We have Mary Hannafin, and is currently Mayor of a local authority in South County Dublin. Mary has also served at the Cabinet level uh, in a variety of roles, notably as Minister for Children, 
Minister for Education and Science, Minister for Social and Family Affairs, Minister for Tourism, mm -hmm. Culture and Sport, Minister for Enterprise, Trade and Innovation. So there's a lot of caps and expertise to bring to, to today's discussion. We have Oscar Yara, or Jara? Hara. Hara. I'm not good in the hate silence, Jays. Um, and you're director of the Center for Popular Education in yeah. Costa Rica. You're both an educator and a sociologist. Um, you've been leading training activities in popular education across all Latin American countries, but also in Europe, Canada, Southeast Asia. And you have several publications on the topic, uh, as well as expertise on social movements. So great to have you here today, too. We have Rilly Apelainen, who is president of the EU NGO platform Concord. I'm sure many of you, you know it well. Is director of sustainable development at Fingo, the Finnish development NGO platform but is also founder and chair of Bridge 47, which is a global network to bring young people together to share and learn with the help of global citizenship education. Welcome, really. And then we have Lydia Ruprecht, and you're team leader for global citizenship education at UNESCO. Uh, since 2014, I believe, you've been promoting global citizenship education worldwide, helping learners of all ages and genders becoming proactive contributors to a more just, peaceful, and sustainable world. You currently have responsibility for revising the 1974 recommendation that we heard spoken about this morning, um, and I'm sure that this Congress hopefully can also help you uh, in that effort. So let's turn to the discussion um, after, after that, uh, those introductions. So this declaration needs to be implemented, right? It uh, uh, has uh, to go from the words, the vision, to, to action on the ground, engaging with a diverse range of, of people, communities, um, but also it has a role for everybody, but a role for people working together. So over the coming hour, we have a mission. We have to discuss how diverse development and education actors can unite around this common vision for global education um, and really see what we can do working together. So we're going to have a, a warm-up with some introductory remarks by uh, our panelists, and we're going to start with Anna, because we've heard a lot about youth this morning, and youth, they say, youth are not just the future, youth are now, right? Um, but we will have more young people, hopefully, uh, coming uh, in the future. Can you share your views on the place of global education in youth policy, um, but also in national youth strategies? Give us a sense of what's happening uh, in your space, and maybe then we can follow up with a question or two around your, your innovations. The floor is yours, Anya. Thank you. Thank you for uh, the question, also for the invitation. Uh, for those of you who have, have never heard of the European Youth Forum, we are the largest youth platform in the world. We're gathering more than 100 national youth councils and international youth NGOs across the continent um, of Europe, bringing together a variety of different topics, uh, different voices. Um, so youth policies is as well the core of our work, something that we work on uh, daily. And global education is something that is not really been mentioned as the thing. But when you look at different youth policies, you can see elements of global education in a lot of it. We have youth policies that are focusing on sustainable development that takes elements from there. We have youth policies on social economic inclusion, on education in general. So there is a lot of different youth policies that are targeting um, global education and I think that is important because global education should not be a one core document core policy but should be mainstream across different topics and this is something that we at the European Youth Forum together with our uh, membership are doing so bringing this global global perspective to different topics both on national <coughs> levels international levels but also globally and we are very happy that we have um, 11 of our MOs that are um, that were involved in the design of this declaration as well because it is important to bring those voices uh, forward you also mentioned the national youth strategies i have to say that some sh some countries still don't have a comprehensive youth strategy or if they are done they are usually drafted very quickly um, without involvement of young people which should be the core um, stakeholders in in this uh, but there are some countries that have very well um, uh, as well process-wise uh, drafted and, and confirmed, adopted um, youth strategies. And we've, we went through some of them, and global education as well is not mentioned in, in really in, uh, um, as such, but also there, there is a lot of things that um, are kind of 
being able to be uh, taken out from that. And uh, we also believe that it is important that um, non-formal education is then the core um, when we talk about the global education because youth organizations are really the, pro the professional ones when it comes to uh, non-formal education uh, coming out with a lot of different ideas. Um, to bring this topic forward to young people, especially um, as, it, as it was mentioned, we're not just currently now, but we also have to design policies, and that is the intent of the policies to speak on uh, for generations coming behind us. Thank you very much, Anja. Maybe if you could just, we could follow up on getting a flavor of, of the innovations that are happening in the youth uh, organization space. And, you know, we're, we're seeing young people are, are on the streets, young people are, are leading. The, the fights against poverty, climate change, um, you're interacting with them. And, and so what, what fresh new elements can you bring to this global education? Uh, yeah, we are, um, I would say, the generation that is really out there. Um, and if we look in, uh, at the history, the biggest changes happened when youth uh, was active, when youth was on the streets, all the re revolution happened because of a student movement or a, a youth movement. So I think that this is one of the kind of the energy or the drivers that we have to change the world. Uh, the, there's a lot of different innovative approaches that youth organizations are taking. Um, they are taking place in a physical format or as well online, and it could be streamlined as a, a direct um, kind of youth participation that we know, but also different methods of how to involve young people. And what it is important in, in this type of education is that it's young people for young people. So it's not, you know, we have a professor teaching us, but we're doing this together. And uh, we're, we're um, I, I would say one of the innovative approach that I think that the, the adult world, world is still trying to adopt is that we're learning on our mistakes. And this is very, very uh, important that we have. So giving, giving us the space that we learn in practice how things mm -hmm. can be done, how things can evolve, um, so that it's not just uh, listening, but also taking actions and, and uh, with practice um, adopting this concept of global education. Thank you, Anya. And that makes me think of what we heard about learning to do this morning from Mr. Garnier, and it sounds very much in, in that spirit. Let me turn now to Oscar um, and hear from you. Um, with your caps of Latin America, but also your engagement uh, in the European space. Um, can you tell us a bit more about what are these globe transformative education concepts that we have in Latin America that you're working with? Um, how are those concepts maybe different, but also converging with what we're seeing in this global education declaration? Um, and, and give us a flavor of, again, the openings that we have to, to have a common vision. Thank okay, you. thank you, Aida. Good morning. I'm really pleased to be here and have the opportunity of uh, participate in this important European Congress coming from Latin America, coming from a small country as Costa Rica, as uh, Dr. Uh, Garnier comes, and also from the uh, Latin American and uh, Caribbean Council of Popular Education, inspired by the uh, thinking of Paulo Freire, and we are doing work in, different, uh, in our different country. So um, the first uh, thing that I would like to, to say is that uh, in these different approaches to what is uh, global education, I want to thank Manuela Mesa that is here because she from Spain had helped us to understand the development of the historical process from the original um, ed education for development or development education as the different uh, um, uh, curves that these reflections have been uh, debated through many countries. And from Latin America, I would say that uh, our conception um, put emphasis in these things. We think that uh, we, call, we talk about transformative education for global citizenship. So global education, we use it in terms of transformative education for global citizenship. That means that we are always talking education related with change, with change in processes, relation between practice and theory, relation between life and learn, education and action. But also, we are talking about the global multicultural democratic citizenship. So the aim of this process is to build really a cultural, um, a dem um, democratic culture uh, for all the, our countries. 
Uh, we have seen the declaration that uh, you are going to discuss and approve uh, in the, during this Congress. And we would like to uh, point some important things. The first thing is that uh, we think we are facing um, really at, at a global level um, an ethical confrontation. You know? So we, the, the, the main confrontation of this time of history is an ethical confrontation between two paradigms. We have a paradigm centered in profit, individualist, consumerist, authoritarianism, depredation, and colonialism. And we have another paradigm that is always present is solidarity, diversity, inclusion, democracy, life care, and peace. And this ethical confrontation uh, goes not only as a, as a statement, but it is related to political, pedagogical, and methodological challenges that I think it are contained in this declaration. So there are some aspects, particular aspects. First, uh, a synergy between local and global knowledge, concerns, and actions. So it's important that this declaration puts the effort in a strategic long-term vision, and a strategic long-term framework, and also the conception of lifelong learning and life-wide learning. So, uh, we are mm, now in, the, in a moment of history where at least talking about transformative education for global citizenship means, I'm going to point just br briefly, five aspects. First one, the understanding of the global ties and tensions that we are facing. The second one, to promote critical thinking, as uh, Professor Garnier has um, and pointed today, and other persons have also um, and, uh, analyzed, um, and a critical thinking that can allow us to think by ourselves. Um, the third one, a critical pedagogy. We need a pedagogy for life, a pedagogy from life, a pedagogy through life. So the pedagogy is not only uh, a separate aspect, but it has to relate it to everything that concerns our life. And that's why we take in account the process of the Paulo Freire's conception of uh, education when he, in his books, Pedagogy of Oppressed, Pedagogy of Hope, Pedagogy of Indignation, and also the book that uh, his widow, um, Anita, kept from other writings that he had when she talks Pedagogy of the, um, the Future um, uh, I, I'm coming from from France, so it comes the reps uh, from dreams, uh, dreams. dreams. Um, the fourth one is uh, we need to promote an educational justice. Uh, we need that means that we need to reinforce all the efforts for the excluded sectors and all the efforts with the excluded sectors. So building educational justice is important. And finally, uh, the importance that this declaration consider the monitoring process. Uh, and then beyond the declaration, then we need to do a follow-up of what are this declaration means in the local, national, and global levels. So uh, it can happen that, like in others, for example, in 1990, edu Education for All, the John Tien uh, uh, meeting, uh, talked a very wide and interesting vision of education, uh, also in, uh, in the, the Millennium Declaration at uh, 2020,000, and then some goals and, and targets went to 2015, 2030, but the process was narrowing and shortening what we were considering before. But now I think this declaration again <coughs> recovers the wide perspective, the strategic perspective of when we are working on transformative global education. Finally, I just want to say that the declaration itself is a challenge. The declaration, so we have also the, the challenge to be coherent with what is, it is presented. And um, I, I would like to say that with Paulo Freire, he says that history is not predetermined. History is always a possibility. So at this particular moments of history with all the complexity, we need to reinforce the idea that w the history as a possibility means that we need to be subjects of construction of the future. 
and I finish with his statement. He says, education alone doesn't change the world, but change the persons who can transform the world. That's the main challenge and the main task that we have at this moment. Thank you so much, Oscar. Thank you. So we hear about local and global and the importance of those links between the local and global and everything that is global is local. So Mary, uh, as a mayor in a local government authority, can you tell us what role you see local governments playing in fostering active global citizenship, but also enabling that community engagement that you can get and, and bringing in also an, an, an inclusive approach to that community engagement with also marginalized groups? Okay, uh, delighted delighted to see so many international visitors here um, and thank you all for coming. Yes, I always take the view, having had experience at government and at local level, that the role of government is to provide the essentials, to provide for health, to provide for education, to provide for employment, to provide for welfare. The role of local government is to provide for the quality of that life. <clears throat> so it's your parks, it's your public spaces, it's your social housing, it's your community building. Um, so our local authorities are critical to the personal development, to the community development, and therefore then to global citizenship as well. And I'm fortunate enough to represent a very beautiful area that goes from the mountains to the sea. We host 350 Ukrainian refugees in the centre. We provide for them their health needs, English language training, preparation for employment, etc. At the other side of the county, the homes of Van Morrison, Enya and Bono, um, all living in the same county, in the same community. And our role then is to ensure that we have a community that is well integrated and that lives and works well together. And recently we celebrated Africa Day and we celebrated India Day with hundreds of citizens of our county uh, who have come from those backgrounds. And such a wonderful cacophony of sound and of colour and of music and of dance, etc. And at the moment we're running our Festival of Social Inclusion, uh, which includes all of those communities. And actually, wonderful and all as those Africa and India days were, probably more significant was the women's intercultural breakfast, because there you had a young girl from Mongolia doing a dance, but you also have the Egyptians bringing their food. So rather than celebrating the different cultures in our community, we were integrating the cultures in our community. And I think that is where one of our very big challenges is. Well, we have full-time officers in our council, full-time social inclusion units, who are dealing with these communities, but also with the other aspects of our own communities. And one of the big things which we did in the last local elections, and we'll be doing next time, is a voter education programme to ensure that people are registered, that people are aware of their rights, but also aware of the fact that they can stand for election and can be candidates. Because a lot of new communities don't realise that you can for local elections with far less restrictions than running for a national parliament. Our new development plan has set out a 15 minute county that would only take you 15 minutes to be able to get from your home to work, to play, to, to shop, etc. And this is all feeding into the sustainability agenda. Uh, our active travel, wonderful cycle lanes that we built during COVID. We didn't have to go through all the rules and regulations during COVID, so we just did it. Now we have to make them all permanent. Um, we run the Green Schools Committee and Global Citizenship is now one of the factors in that Green Schools um, uh, um, enterprise, we'll call it. Um, obviously, the usual things that local governments do, like litter campaigns and dog fouling and gum, etc. We're doing a housing retrofit of all of our council houses, um, of our council buildings to make them carbon neutral, our public lighting, 85%, etc. Uh, we were the first local authority to sign the European Circular Cities Declaration. So we're very conscious of the fact that we are Dunleary, we are Dublin, we are Ireland, but we are also international. And we have a twinning arrangement with um, Japan, with um, Paris, or areas within obviously, with Holyhead. And I think we need to look further afield. And I'm thinking I'd like Costa Rica. I think our Dunleary and Costa Rica could be very good partners after today. You know? um, the, obviously, within our own communities, 
our whole active age, because we've quite an elderly population as well, um, and to ensure that where we live and how we live um, is a comfortable and safe environment for all of those people. For our marginalised groups, uh, for disadvantaged groups, and working with um, what we call our Southside Partnership, which provides capacity building and training uh, and employment support, and also the public participation network, which is made up of all of the voluntary organisations um, who then work with the local authority, or rather we feed off them uh, and we learn from them and ensure that they are involved in all of our various committees and our strategic policy committees particularly. Just to quickly touch on what I see as some of the challenges for all of the things that we're talking about today. I think I mentioned the words integration rather than celebration. It's very easy to have an India Day and to celebrate it. What we really need is the integration of form into all of our communities. Um, I think getting people to realise that saving the world means saving locally. Um, in my first life, when I actually was a vice president of the European Youth Forum, yeah. in my second life, when I was a teacher, it always struck me that the girls wanted to save the dolphin and save the whale and save the world. And behind the radiator, you had the crisp packets <laughs> because they didn't see the connection between what they were doing themselves and what they're doing um, throughout the world. And I think that connection we need to continually make, which is why local authorities, I believe, are important in that agenda. Um, I think getting people to participate in the electoral process and that there isn't a gap between the NGO and the elected representatives. We are all in this together. Um, and finally, just to say that in Dunleary, and I talked about, you know, the, the Ukrainian refugee, or Bono. We have a lovely village, I won't tell you the name of it, or you'd all go there, <laughs> in the county, where in a pub you could find Bono having a pint with Bruce Springsteen. Or tomorrow it could be Michelle Obama, or it could be any world leader. Side by side with the man who lives in the council house. And the great thing about it is they ignore each other, right? And why is that important? is because they're comfortable with each other in the same space, living in the same area, working together and recognising and respecting each other. And I think the big challenge for us as we look to 2050 is to bring about change with respect for the views of all the other people involved. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mary. And instead of local to global, we can say crisps to dolphins now. <laughs> crisps to dolphins, yes. And now we're talking about learning to live together that we heard about this morning as well from Professor Gagne. So the next person to take the floor is working at the European level, at the national level, and quite possibly at the global level too, really, I guess, when, when, when you talk about what you're doing. Um, more involved in civil society for development, uh, I would say. So can you give us a sense now from your bird's eye view also of the civil society sector, um, which is very, very diverse, um, about how civil society organizations are engaging in global education beyond awareness raising um, and building public support for aid and development to transformative learning. And what do you see maybe as both the opportunities, but maybe some risks as well, um, associated with this diversity um, as we talk about a common vision? Really, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you, Ida, and thank you, all the friends sitting here. I'm very comfortable I'm sitting here between the civil society activists, which I am assuming that exactly all of you who are sitting here in the room as well, because I think that all of us, we have super important role to play as citizens. So it's not only the governments or the local authorities who should implement all that, because without the implementation, nothing is going to be happen. And that's why I think that it's in the shoulders of every each of us to do our part of, of that. Some of us, we can do that in different ways, but I think that collective leadership, collective participation, finding the ways which really mostly fit for you, that's absolutely important because the earth is in fire. I'm sorry to say that I don't believe that the world exists in 2050. I, I think that oh, it, it definitely is different what is at the moment. And this is not at all time to just make the papers and making the papers after the papers and then not really having the implementation. I think that this is really the crucial, it's now or never that where we need to definitely act, all of us. 
And I think that we definitely need to do something on that, and we need to speed up. We need to use the intelligence, expertise, knowledge, really learning from each other. And I think that the key word here is the learning, because definitely we need to unlearn about the current situation while we used to do the things in 20 years, in 50 years back. I think that it's, it's really the key that we need to challenge every one of us, and starting from myself, that how I'm behaving, what I'm doing, am I really doing something good for my community? Am I really taking all the possibilities which are coming to me? Am I taking those seriously? And I think that this is absolutely must to do that now. We all are aware that there are now the uh, climate negotiations starting in Egypt at the moment. And already there are the ministers who are saying that the best solution is that it has to happen, the, the meeting happens. Nothing about the content, no ambitious, just that the meeting happened. And I think this is, this is not the way how we should act. At. We have to go wherever we go, that we have to have the ambitious goal, and we need to get something out, which is really meaningful, it really makes the change, it makes some kind of impact, so that we human beings, beings who are the visitors in this planet, we can behave much more better, we can behave well, we can keep this planet for the next generations. And I, I, I love the youth people who are really saying that's not in the politically correct, because I think that's, that's what we need to hear. And I think that uh, that's really the very good example about the empowering, engaging, really taking the responsibility seriously. But we can't wait that you are in, in the politicians or presidents or whoever, head of the states, sorry, we don't really have the time. We need to take the responsibility, whatever age where we are, we have to take this responsibility. I, I think that is really, really crucial. And of course, civil society organizations is doing our part. It's our role, definitely, um, using the multiple roles what we are having. The one is that holding the governments accountable. That's, that's really one of the important things. But we are doing quite a lot of internal work as well, challenging ourselves really finding the ways how we act, how we behave, can we be better persons for, for the planet and, and the whole community together on there? How could we really find the innovation so that we can move on and not stuck on, on the previous things and, and not just believe that technology is saving the whole world? Definitely it helps, but it's not the whole story. We, we have to really extremely careful on that, how we, how we use on that. So I, I think that it's, it's important that the uh, the civil society is taking its own piece, but we are more than happy to collaborate with the others because we really believe that none of us is, is not really responsible or capable even to do. And I've said earlier many times that I don't want to be the prime minister of the world. It's not my role. I'm not voted on that. I'm, I'm happy to be the, the, um, the civil society representative and doing my piece, but challenging the other actors together and finding the ways how we can really, really find the good, good solutions. I think the one point perhaps um, to raise us as well is the wording, what, what we are using. And, and uh, in, in my roles, um, we, we are really trying to really build the connections globally and, and really working with the civil society activists and civil society organizations, other, other actors as well globally. And I, I really liked what Oscar said about this, this, how does it really sound out of Europe, about the words what we are using here in, in Europe. And, and unfortunately for the word of the global education, there are other connotations. And, and definitely I, I really think that the, what we definitely need is the transformation. And I, I really like this, this how Oscar um, formulated that, that we need to have this transformative education because we need to challenge education as such. The formal education, informal education, non-formal education, there has the histories behind, but that need to be transformed and challenged internally as, as well. But then we need to have these global citizens who are actively, they are locally acting, which exactly refers very much in, in the global level. Thank you. Thank you very much. For me. Um, and I really take away the point about us all as actors challenging ourselves too, and it brings us to these tensions and ties that Oscar was talking about, the paradigms that we have. Um, which uh, are, are challenging and somehow we're programmed ourselves in some ways to, to think and behave in, cer in certain ways. Um, and so now let's turn to Lydia, um, who has also got a, a very uh, interesting um, um, perspective from the international level around education policy. Um, and 
UNESCO is revising the 1974 recommendation. Can you tell us and tell, tell the group here, what, what's the essence of that revision? What, why are you doing it? Um, and where you see those common grounds and synergies with this global education for Europe process? Thank okay, you. thank you very much. I'm very happy to be here and to, to listen to the panels this morning and to listen to you all right now. And I, I feel sometimes like I'm, as if I'm a bit of an astronaut looking at the planet. And I know that the image has been used very often to, to mobilize and a uh, sense of, of planetary citizenship, but there's also a conceptual distance here. When, when you're sitting maybe on the planet, but still quite conceptually on a different, working on a different scale, you, you tend to see what, res, what assembles and not differentiates. Um, but I'll say a, a few words about uh, the, the differences and similarities in a second. First about um, the recommendation. So this recommendation is one of eight UNESCO recommendations uh, adopted by the organization in the field of education. Um, it is a legal, what we call legal normative instrument, um, um, and in the hierarchy of norms, it is, is it, it would be below a convention. The convention is legally binding, so this is non-legally binding. It's not adopted or ratified by, by national uh, um, uh, parliaments, but it is adopted by the General Assembly of Member States, so it does have that political moral authority, and also uh, it is built into UNESCO statu uh, statutes and rules that uh, the, uh, the Assembly of Nations monitor the implementation of these instruments. So there is a, a, a mechanism to hold governments accountable and ask them to report. And in fact, as many of you know, the, um, that process of collecting reports on the current recommendation is being used to collect data on the, the progress of target 4.7, right? With, with all its limitations, it is what has been agreed so far as the way to move forward and monitor global progress. Now, um, that instrument, I've, I, I don't know if you've had the opportunity to read it, it is, is a remarkably inspiring instrument, I have to say. When you think it was written in the 70s and, and in the middle of the Cold War, and where, where we, we are maybe um, tending to think that it's very different, but alas not, uh, there are in, immense tensions uh, and, and, and uh, processes of decolonization in the 70s, uh, and yet they agreed on, on this instrument. And, and it was very forward-looking as it started to integrate notions of, uh, of environmental protection. Unfortunately, women's rights and gender equality were not mentioned, but there are other issues there that, uh, that were quite advanced on its time. Many things were not there. And, uh, and because this instrument still plays a role today as the legal foundation for Target 4.7, SDG 4, there was a sense that there was a need to update this instrument to equip countries with a, with a, with an, a well-constructed tool to uh, inspire policy reform and to, to also co to create a new consensus at a global level of the, the ultimate purpose of education. So this, this document is now being revised and it, and it corresponds quite nicely with the transformative education process, which is also that policy discussion that is, in, that is, that is inspiring the revision. And of course, the outcomes of the International Commission on the Future of Education, which came out with their report last year and gives a, a, some very important directives um, of, of uh, where should be those changes to make the instrument more impactful and relevant. So the, the first draft was done on the basis of, a, of, of numerous uh, inputs received, uh, and it was sent to uh, member states in September and is now in the hands of governments. That's, those are the statutory processes established by or the organization and sent to line ministries, so it could be ministries of foreign affairs, ministries of education or science or culture, depending on who is officially responsible for UNESCO. Um, and they have until the 23rd of uh, December to submit their written comments and observation. And now this and a second draft will be then prepared, resubmitted in April, and then negotiated uh, among governments uh, uh, in end of May, early June, and hopefully reach a consensus on a new document uh, for adoption in November, uh, which would mark, in fact, UNESCO's contribution to the, to the uh, 75th anniversary of the Declaration of Human Rights. Great. So that's about the recommendation. Thank you. And, and maybe just a, a word on, on how this Global Education Congress um, and the Declaration fits with uh, your work. Are, are there kind of interactions, some osmosis between the two? Yes. Actually, that, uh, I have a few points that I, I'd like to make. I don't know if I can take a few minutes now. Well, when, well maybe just to highlight. What would you okay. say are like the, to the top two? Uh, and then maybe we can take, take Absolutely, it Absolutely, because there's a lot to say, actually. Running. Thank you. Um, then I'll just to be brief, with it, is that um, uh, taking, again, this sort of uh, this, uh, this um, spatial distance 
uh, from what is the, disc, the process uh, historically. It seems like the declaration marks a significant uh, uh, step forward in, in turning the page on the MDGs um, in the sense that uh, the, um, the, the declaration really embraces the, the transformative, what we, had, we see as the transformative ambition of, of the sustainable development agenda. The term transformation is actually in the document. Um, and so compared to what we thought of the, uh, the global declaration, the global education declaration as, as a, um, a somewhat maybe a conservative uh, uh, um, uh, horizon, it seems to be, uh, to definitely res resonate with the global and normative uh, frames in the sense that international solidarity, international understanding is not only an objective for foreign policy, but actually seem to, mm -hmm. to resonate with uh, national interests. And this is really fundamental, and that continuity between the global and the national, which is, which is uh, important, and therefore fully owned by ministries of education. And this has also been the weakest point, I think, of global education in many ways. It has been uh, uh, insufficiently uh, infused in the, in the education uh, system. And, and for us as well, so the other uh, point that we're quite interesting in the parallels is that the, the idea that um, uh, there is a continuity between the internal and external peace, as we say in, in UNESCO, and this notion of lasting peace, is that um, it, it is, it's not just about the peace among nations, right? Uh, but it's about ensuring that individuals have the rights and the, their dignity, uh, and that there's uh, the conditions within a country which uh, uh, allow for uh, the peaceful relations among nations. And seeing that continuum between the, the national and the global, the individual and the collective, um, is, is quite uh, significant in the declaration. And we're happy to see that. And, and so far as it does uh, that resonate with the ambitions of the tran that transformative, uh, emancipatory ambition of the 1974 recommendation. Brilliant. Oh, then I'll stop here. Thank you very much, Lydia. And, and we're getting a common thread here of, of the transformative. And I guess anyone in the room who wants to find out more about this 23rd of December deadline and how to influence your, your country's contributions to the recommendation might want to talk to you uh, in the sidelines uh, after, after this session. Um, I am not able to see if there are questions for the floor. Um, but uh, if there are, somebody can please feel free to raise their hand because I'm not, I'm not getting it on the Slido. But I know we want to talk, uh, we want to invite Ms. Aravella Zakarillo, who is the chair of UNECE's Committee on Education for Sustainable Development, to say a few words because uh, uh, I believe you, you want to share a perspective about working together. Thank you. Thank you, Ada, for giving me the floor. Uh, <clears throat> uh, I was thinking to say something else, but after listening all the distinguished speakers, I just want to say uh, only that the proof that this Global Education Declaration 2050 uh, uh, unites the diversity is in this room. If you look each other, you will see that we are from the fields of civic education, education for sustainable development, global education, developmental education, popular education. And what is bring us here is education. And what we uh, aim to do here is to see where we meet each other and where we are uh, and where we want to go. I'm just saying this because I'm as a chair of the UNEC as the steering committee. Uh, I had the privilege to work very close with Jean and with many of you uh, during the launching of this process. And what we realized is that uh, this is the best uh, opportunity for us, these differences or these different perspectives that we have to see that they are our similarities, our common, and this our common future. And I had also the honor before three weeks in Cyprus to adopt the UNEC, uh, the UNEC SD declaration for 2030. And the people, many people of you, you were in Cyprus to work together for the ESD. I'm just saying this that it's time to see truly what is joining us and what is bringing us together. What is bring us together is all these things that are explained very clearly in a very simple way in this global education declaration. 
the dignity, the solidarity, the equity, uh, the, the democracy. And all of us, we are here independently which umbrella or which hat we had to achieve this. So what is very important for me that I'm finishing is that the UNEC ESD Steering Committee is a uh, um, uh, um, plan and is open to work very closely with all of you and with Jean and bring together in ESD the global education because what is needed for us is to establish a culture of partnership. A culture of partnership, not just to say that we have to collaborate, but what type of partnership, in which way, how we will sustain these partnerships, what, where we want, when, when do we want to, what we want to do with this. This culture of partnership which is based on our ownership. Thank you. Okay, well, we have uh, just about seven minutes left, um, and uh, I'd like to um, ask our panelists uh, for a quick round robin, uh, maybe one minute each max, um, with, uh, to tell the group here, but also what you're going to do when you go back to your offices or back to your homes tomorrow. So we've heard about partnership, but constructive criticism as well, um, and, and so much uh, diversity. Um, how ready are you uh, in your respective spaces to uh, align or even pool strategies around global education? What would it take to make it happen? Or what one action will you do uh, after this conference to, make, uh, to work behind this common vision for global education to 2050? And let me start with Oscar. <laughs> OK, Ida. Thank you. Well, briefly, I would like to say that um, if we're talking about the uni unity of diversity, we are not talking about uniformity, mm -hmm. to have an homogeneous, but we need to respect also the diversity, the different approaches, but we need to see what are we going to get with the different efforts that we do in different uh, places. So I remember this idea that if we have a name and we have an utopia, this utopia is not something that it has the end of the way, is what has to lead the way that we are going to follow from this moment. So I think that this is a very challenging moment where, for example, these declarations opens us to reflect on our own particular context here in Europe and in Latin America or in other contexts, what means to do transformative education? How can we in, in, in each country develop a democratic culture or a culture of democracy or a culture of partnership in our particular spaces and then share this process and then uh, try to, to think that this goal that we want to achieve must lead the path and must lead the steps that we do from now on. Brilliant. Learning from each other. Brilliant, learning from each other. Thank you very much, Oscar. Lydia, same question to you. Yeah, thank you. I, I, was, I was about to say something similar in the sense that though we see at a global level that the term global remains profoundly problematic and though we refer to global citizenship education, um, it, it inevitably, inevitably carries this Eurocentric a perspective uh, and appears as something that is oppressive or, or, or undermines national interests or competes with nat national interests. And so uh, I think it was Arndt that mentioned this earlier, and, and this is also UNESCO's view, that we need to um, uh, go beyond the terms and the language. We need to look at the competencies uh, and the values that are actually underlining the terms and unite around, coalesce around that vision, which is uh, for UNESCO very much embedded in the vision of the Futures of Education report and the the Secretary General's um, vision statement as well that emanated from the Transforming Education Summit. And for me, transpires in the very much in this declaration. That said, the conversation around those controversies is essential, is exactly for the reason that you just mentioned, Oscar, that these, these are very healthy conversations. And that is what participation is about, that everybody has a, a, participates in defining the concept and the vision. And it's in that the disagreement and the, and the fact that we can agree to disagree, but also agree to agree on certain things. Um, so that is one thing. And then lastly, what I take away is the monitoring follow-up. This is something that has been significantly reinforced um, in the 1974 recommendation, thanks to many inputs of colleagues that are here. Uh, and we do think that it has to be a participatory process. 
uh, for the reason they really mentioned, that we mm. need to have many parties and stakeholders um, holding each other accountable uh, with everyone in their position, but participating in that effort of monitoring and follow-up. So that is, for me, a, a clear takeaway message and, and a commitment uh, in the long term. Excellent. Thank, thank you very you. much. Mary. Thank you very much. When I first got the invitation to this, and thank you for the invitation, it included a paragraph to say we will be talking about synergies and synthesis and strategies. <laughs> and I sent it back and I said, I have no idea what you're talking about. And I'm around long enough to have seen an awful lot of synergies, synthesis and strategies. Right? And we do really need to bring this down to local level and to personal level. And the one thing I would take away, because when I looked at it first, um, I'm sure local authorities would say, that's nothing to do with me. Uh, whereas, in fact, the more I thought about it, I realised it has. So I think um, GE 2050 needs to be branded in a way that it includes everybody. So my takeaway from this would be, you asked, what am I going to do next? I'm going to go back and chair a meeting on the budget. That's what I'm going to do next. Then I'm going to fly to Costa Rica to do a twinning, um, because I think it would be very important for that global education and global citizenship. Um, and after that, then, I think, to look at what we're doing, because we are all individually doing a huge amount, but we're not branding it in a way that makes us realise that we're part of this global world, this global education, this global citizenship. So that's where I'd go. Excellent. Thank you. And you've got some good resources of people who talk about one and one world in, in your constituency, too. We might have give you a hand in the branding. Um, really, to you. I think we all are flying to Costa Rica. <laughs> I, I, I do hope that we compensate as well when we are flying and, and taking our responsibilities on that. We go by train. Yeah, it, or by boat. That's another. Or just anyway, uh, I, I think that exactly um, the key word from my point of view is the coherence. I think that we have to be coherent in the global level, in the European level, in the, in the national level, in the local levels. And, and that is really that exactly all the politis, political decisions or actions, what we do, they are really uh, achieving and, and working in the same direction. But at the same time, I, I think that it's really important what, that we have these spaces where we can really have the dialogue. Because this is the main point which I really value a lot is that we come together we are learning from each other, we are empowering each other, we are engaging. And that is the essence for all the work what we have to do back home. Thank you. Thank you very much. Anya. Yeah, at the European Youth Forum, uh, we did a youth progress index measuring the development or the progress of the countries if we take out the GDP. And Costa Rica was among the top uh, countries in the world, so I think that's also a good idea um, uh, to go there and see uh, what they're doing. Uh, when they're uh, measuring human impact uh, rather than money itself. Uh, but when we uh, come to this one, I think that, let's say, current educational systems are failing because they were designed at the time by a generation that didn't understand or like obviously didn't know what the future holds. So the main thing is that we look ahead. So not only what are the current needs uh, that we need, but what are the future needs, what we will need in the future. And what uh, we will do as, as ZIT organizations is that we will continue on um, fighting to being involved and hopefully we won't, we won't, need, to, we won't need to fight uh, to be involved or to have the seat in, at the table because we will automat automatically get it because it is important that uh, young people are the core um, uh, stakeholders when it comes to designing the education, especially if we look ahead and that this education doesn't only answer the needs of today, but also the needs of tomorrow. Brilliant. Thank you very much. Well, I think that... I think that we have a, a, a Jean Costa Rica pure learning mission to do uh, for sure. Uh, so that's the first action point uh, as we start monitoring uh, the declaration. Um, but let me just say there are fabulous ideas on this panel on what we can do together. Um, how we can respect each other's diversity and differences of a view, but that there is a common ground. And that's a fabulous starting point, BIS, for the second Declaration on Global Education. Thank you all very much, um, and uh, look forward to the rest of the conference. Thank you. Thank you.